I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. Abolishing slavery settles the fate for all coming time, not only of the millions now in bondage, but of unborn millions to come. So we decided the thing we had in common was love, and from love came peace. So we decided to work for world peace. Hi, I'm Doug Usher, your Shawi missionary here in Peru. Uh, behind me is, uh, is an old house. It's been here for many years. It's falling apart. The bugs are eating it. But this is uh, what we want to be the home of our future training center here in Yurimaguas. You know, there are, we counted over 30 communities that have believers but don't have a pastor. So we feel one of the great needs of the ministry right now is to train up young men uh, to pastor these churches, leaders, uh, even Sunday school teachers, help them to fulfill the purposes of God in their churches. And uh, so this is kind of our vision for the future is to be able to, to uh, tear this old building down and to construct a two-story building with some dormitories up above for the, the guys to stay uh, when they come and uh, the downstairs would be our our training center and so uh, you know none of this is possible without you without your support financially your prayer support and uh, we're so thankful for you and for all that you do for the ministry here in Peru right now we're in the middle of a project of uh, cleaning out the bats out of this uh, this house that's here on our property this is the church's property that we've had in Yurimaguas for years and uh, it's a beautiful property, but this is where Blanca and I were, will be moving into here in, December, in November, hopefully. And uh, we have uh, expelled all of the bats. There were probably two to three hundred bats living in this attic. And so, uh, thankfully, we are able to get them out of there, and hopefully we can keep them out. We have some ideas to, to try to accomplish that. But uh, just wanted to let you know what's happening here. And uh, we're excited about what the Lord's doing. And uh, we thank you so much for your support. Hope you have a great day. God bless. Amen. Woo. That is our pastor in Peru. He's talking about our staff in Peru. We have 44 Grace Church staff in Peru. Uh, 37 indigenous pastors who lead the churches. Eight indigenous missionaries who travel the rivers and take our messages and our uh, everything that we can give them to support the churches. And you heard that, 30 communities with believers, no pastor. So our work is far from done in Peru. And in the midst of all of this pandemic, they were locked down for nine months in Lima. They just got back. And uh, you know that Blanca has been uh, battling cancer and she finally got a clean bill of health uh, the last couple of weeks. So praise God for that. So excited. Uh, you know, just the normal everyday problems like vampire bats in your house. Uh, yeah, it's a little different than the fruit bats. And, and uh, we bought that house 22 years ago. Pastor Jim and I, on behalf of the ministry, $50,000. The last bid we got for getting rid of the bats was $50,000. So uh, thankfully, Doug and the team have been able to uh, expel them. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that they stay away and that we can keep the eaves covered up. But, you know, with that in mind, that's why we have this silent auction stuff in the back of the auditorium. We don't normally set up an auction in our, uh, you know, our chapel area, if you will, or, or our uh, auditorium. But the silent auction and the live auction November 1st from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m., will be for you, for all of you watching online that still aren't able to be here uh, or just for health risks are, are at home. Uh, and you can bid on all of the items 
The silent auction has some really cool stuff. Matter of fact, uh, there's a trip for two, all expense paid, to Peru on my next mission trip. That's like a $6,000 uh, uh, value. You can bid, take your spouse or take someone with you. And what could be better than the jungle and me? <clears throat> so anyways, uh, we'd love to take you on that mission trip. We also have Rolling Hills uh, Country Club, a uh, fo uh, uh, foursome. You can go and play. Uh, you can't play there unless you, you have this. And, uh, uh, and so I just encourage you to bid on that. Uh, we have an entire real estate brokerage license, the entire schooling, uh, like a $900 or $1,000 value. You can bid on that and get your brokerage license if you've been thinking about it. So there's a lot of cool stuff on top of the really awesome sports stuff and everything else. Please get involved because losing the golf tournament means we lost about 25% of the support that goes to Peru. And uh, really, it's closer to 50%. And so we need your support to make that happen. And you know, guys, God is obviously moving. And if you look at what he is doing, rather than what the media is saying, you'll be in a lot better place. And I know that we're, we're watching right now, the, the infections apparently have, have risen. Of course, uh, the testing has tripled. They, we never talk about that. Uh, hospitalization has risen. That is a true statement for our doctors and nurses. We want to be careful. What we're not talk, talking about, though, is the death rate is lower than it has ever been across the country. And we're talking so low that it's immeasurable compared to the height of it in March, April, May, and June. So we, we need to talk about all the facts surrounding this. We do, you know, I, I get tired of hearing people who are politically bantering saying that they're quoting science. I have dealt with 6,000 doctors a week since this pandemic. They just bring me in, feel sorry for the pastor, want to make sure he knows what's going on. And also because we have been in conversations with our governor and uh, we are grateful that we are the only church in the state that was given permission to gather like this. Some of you are wondering if I'm breaking the law or we're breaking, no, we're not. Uh, but on top of it, we have taken every precaution to make this the safest place you'll go. And let me prove that to you. All right. You know, we have the rim halo system. Iodine hydrogen peroxide drops from the ceiling to the floor, wipes out 99.4% of all viruses, including all coronaviruses and this one. And uh, it's in all of our facilities, upstairs, downstairs, the lodge upstairs, downstairs. Uh, but let me just give you scientific fact. You know, when they do a poll or they take a survey, they talk to 1,500 to 3,000 people spread out through all demographics. Did you know that? That's, that's where the, the numbers are coming from. We've had 3,471 people, different people, attend our services since June 7th. So I'd say that's a pretty good scientific balance, right? The 3,471 have worn their, their masks from the street to the seat. They've social distanced to the best of their ability. When they can't, they make sure their mask is on. We have the system in, we take temperatures, they've signed waivers, you've signed waivers, okay? We've had two people test positive. Both of those people showed zero symptoms, but they were around infected people, not at church, but somewhere else. Two people, 3,471. I'm just simply relaying the facts to you, that's all. Not making a statement one way or the other but I don't think you'll find a safer place. Now that could change tomorrow. It's a virus. And I don't wanna scare you, but you're gonna get it. At some degree or another. Viruses do not go away. That's science. So are, are we just going to live in our bedrooms? I'm not. Amen. Here's reality. God is in control. It doesn't matter who gets elected three weeks from now, 17 days from now, God is in control. And it doesn't mean we go around acting stupid, all right? I am not anti-mask. We have never been anti-mask. I believe wearing masks is a good thing for right now, all right? Uh, we're not trying to make you do anything that would jeopardize you. For people that are high risk, we have television, we have closed caption, we have Facebook Live, we have all of these uh, platforms. We want you to be safe, okay? But at the end of the day, church is not a TV show. Church is about the body of Christ coming together to love and support each other. And I'm going to tell you something. We got a lot worse risks that we're facing as a ministry 
than the pandemic. Like six teenagers trying to take their lives. I said four in five days. It's now six and we had six parents call this week whose children were discovered planning their own demise. This is epidemic. This is big. And we have children, teenagers, adults who feel hopeless. I said this to a a guy this morning at 7 a.m. in a meeting before we got rolling today. I said, in 36 years as a professional pastor, I was ordained in 1985. So, you know, 35 35 years. Uh, I obviously wasn't ordained in math. But uh, so in 35 years, I could take all of those years of counseling marriages, working with pastors who counsel marriages, and I could put them all together and not see the marriages that have fallen apart in the last nine months. It's frightening. And listen, you could be and probably are one of those families that are suffering. You have to understand there are things happening to you emotionally, psychologically, and even physically you don't understand. In many ways, we don't understand. It affects, especially guys, we're good, we're good, we're good, we'll push through. No, you won't. It will implode at one point or another. And that really brings me to this series, Stand for Something. And this isn't about standing against the government, standing against, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about standing against a real enemy who is relentless and wants to kill, steal, and destroy your life, your family, everything you stand for, everything we stand for, and that's Satan, he's real, and that's an enemy of darkness, they are real, and they want the destruction of all of the church. And the truth is, God is going to do his work through one entity, it's not the government anyways, it's the church, period. The church will outlast all organisms and organizations because it's been around 2,000 years and the more it's persecuted, the more it's attacked, the more it flourishes. It will outlast Google. It will outlast Amazon. It will outlast most of Tesla. It will outlast everything, all right? So here's what I wanna just encourage you. Today we're gonna look at, at the beginning of this series, how to stand up when the opposition is stacked against you. And I wanna just make this statement. Sometimes the opposition is stacked against you And it comes from the environment, from the pandemic, from the government, from the world situation. Sometimes the odds are stacked against us because we stack the odds against ourselves. I do plenty of that. You know, you're like, why is this happening? Oh, yeah, I did it. Okay. So regardless of that, God has compassion. Aren't you thankful? God loves you. Aren't you thankful? If you're a child of God, you know Jesus is your savior. He doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to build you up. He has a plan for you to prosper you and make you uh, fulfill his purpose in a way that is fulfilling for you. And I go back to a story, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. It's not one that gets a lot of press. Um, It's probably just because I relate to the guy so much, Samson. Apparently only 10 of you know the story because you're laughing, all right? I don't relate to him at all. But Samson was this really good-looking, long-haired, muscle-bound super judge, literally. And Samson's a real person. As a matter of fact, he wasn't a, you know, a fictional character. Uh, these were real people. In the New Testament, we actually read of Judges, judges 13, 14, and 15, uh, and 16 deal with Samson, okay? But in Hebrews, we get a little glimpse at Samson being compared to some of the greats in Scripture. And you're going to find this encouraging, I I promise you, okay? I I like to call Hebrews 11 God's hall of faith, okay? Because it's loaded with people throughout the Old Testament who did amazing things. Some of them were visible to everyone. Some were invisible to most people. See, doing amazing things doesn't mean you just, you you know, you conquer kingdoms or you become the president or you, that's, you can do amazing things that only you and God know about. It's still amazing. And Samson is mentioned in this little list. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, that's not Obama, another one, Samson and Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. I can tell you that much of that list applies to all of those people. Much of that list applies to Samson alone. But on top of the great things he did, he did some really dumb stuff. Thank you, Jesus. That's why I'm a preacher. Because God doesn't disqualify dumb people. Okay? He loves all of us. You know, I think about this. uh, If I summed up all of Samson's life, I could tell you stories. I'll tell you the stories uh, today. But if I summed up his life, it would be really in four words that came at the end of his life. Look at this in Judges 16, 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. Look at this. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Now, he's about to do something that is the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the people of Israel But that is not a statement about God's forgetfulness. God doesn't forget anything. That's a statement about Samson's forgetfulness. And he's responding to God by saying, oh Lord, I know I've blown it. For the 40 years I've been alive, I've blown it many times, but don't forget me. God's like, Sam, I never forgot you, never. Aren't you glad? He never forgets us, never, no matter what we do. Listen, I don't know what you did an hour ago. You could have been screaming at the family, pulling in the parking lot, fighting with the wife. Look, don't look at them right now. You just did dead giveaway, all right? It always cracks me up when I use an illustration. I'm like, yeah, it was us, okay. Um, it could have been something last night, last week, and you're like, oh man, God could never use me. I'm a Christian, I know better. Or maybe you're not a Christian thinking, I'm a terrible person and God would never love me. You're wrong on both accounts. God loves you so much, he gave his son for you. He died on a cross. He washed all your sins away. He rose again three days later. God loves you. And if you're a Christian, God says the moment you trusted in his son, he will never lose you. He will never forsake you. He will never cast you out. How about that? You're like, but, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. No, but God does. He knows everything you think and he still loves you. Now, in this situation, Samson had the odds stacked against him. I want to just show you, see if you can relate to any of this. There's really three major ways that the odds were stacked against Samson. I don't always think of it that way with Samson. I mean, good looking, strong, powerful leader, long hair. Oh, I'd give any, anyways, all that stuff, right? But Samson had the odds stacked against him. First of all, Samson was born into a wicked world. Can you relate? Well, kind of. The world we live in, especially as Americans, no matter how difficult it gets, doesn't compare to the world the Israelites lived in 3,500 years ago. This world was governed by a wicked, polytheistic nation that was ruthless. They're called the Philistines. Probably heard of them. Remember the guy Goliath, nine foot 11 inches that David took down with a stone and a sling? Well, the Philistines have been defeated at that time, but now they're ruling over Israel. You'll see why in a moment. And the wicked world that, that uh, Samson lived in wasn't just because of the Philistines. It was because the people of God had turned their back on God. Look at this in Judges 13.1. Again, the Israelites, <laughs> you might just want to circle that. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. You know, when we know better and we keep doing it, sometimes God has to say, okay, I love you. I won't leave you, but go get your butt kicked over there. Might help you. That might be best. <clears throat> you, you know, two weeks ago I said, you can choose a path that is completely contrary to what God wants. You can say, I'm done with my spouse. I'm out of here. And you can choose that path. It might be the path of least resistance, but it will not be the path that brings satisfaction. It will not bring the path, be the path that brings hope in your life. 
Now, that doesn't mean that if you've gone through a situation like that, you can't regain hope and get back on that path. But when you know, and when I know that that path I'm choosing may have the least resistance for me, but it's not pleasing to God, it's the wrong path. For Samson, he was born into a wicked, wicked world. The Philistines were so wicked, the nation of Israel had been brought into bondage. They were in slavery. Polytheistic means they believed in many gods. One of those gods was Dagon, false god, looked like a dog in the head, and they sacrificed children. Just stop for a moment. I'll talk about this in a few weeks. I mean, it's debatable, to be honest, but... Sacrificing children is the worst thing a society can do. They sacrifice children from infancy to 10 years old. They committed sexual deviance of all kinds. They were wicked. They were ruled by their belly and by their lusts. And so was Israel at this time. Second, Samson needed a miracle just to be born. Now, it's true that all birth is a miracle. You're a miracle. At conception, the zygote as, you know, let's just get away from the Bible, let's go to science, says you are an infusion of DNA and light at conception. It's not even debatable anymore. You are a miracle. And you know what's even more amazing? God designed you in eternity past. Not in your mother's womb in eternity past. So you're, you're a walking, talking miracle. But that's not the miracle I'm talking about with Samson. Look at Judges 13. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless. Let me stop. Isn't it just like a mother to make the ultimate sacrifice, to love her children with a connection that only a mother can have through maternal instinct and never get her name mentioned at all? We only know her as Samson's mom. We know his dad, Manoah, and we'll see in just a moment, she was an extraordinary woman of faith and logic. I find that to be true of many women. But at this point, she was barren and childless. I'm not sure if we can understand this because we do live in a culture that I think we have improved in some areas. One of those areas is your value is not just determined by your family, the size of your family, whether you're single or you're married. Your value is determined by God and how he sees you. In that society, if you couldn't have a child, you were worthless. You were discarded. You were considered a broodmare put out to pasture because you were no good. And look at this but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a, a, a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. This is what we call the Nazarite vow. It's the first time we see it. Dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, we know a couple other guys in Scripture that took the Nazarite vow. The Apostle Paul, Jesus, didn't let a razor touch their head. They were set apart for God's purpose. Samson was supposed to be. And for the deformative, the formative years of his life, he was. But we'll see later, he didn't stay there. He didn't stay with the Nazarite vow the way he should have. The final odd that was stacked against Samson is Samson's birth was so traumatic it nearly caused his father's death. Now, here it is. Manoah freaks out when the woman is pregnant. She's the one going to give birth to a son. She's the one that comes the closest to death uh, physically at the birth of a child. I watched a a uh, documentary on Nigerian women who go out to the banyan tree by themselves to give birth to their child. I'm like, I am not worthy. I mean, it is just unreal. And what a bond. What an amazing thing. What a strong person. I don't care if you have children in a hospital with, uh, you know, an epidural or you're at a banyan tree. You're amazing. And in this moment, Judges 13 he says, we are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. Now, that is a statement that is based on something we read in the Old Testament 
And they knew this, obviously, passed down from generation to generation, that if you see God in any of his glory, in your physical sinful state, you will die. We see an example of that uh, when Moses receives the Ten Commandments, and the Bible says he catches just a glimpse of the back of God, and he turns white. Literally, his hair, his face, everything. That's what happened to me. Presence of God. Anyways, no, I'm just kidding. So white, all of him. It's called Shekinah glory. And he just saw an element. Just to, Remember when Isaiah saw God? I am wicked and evil. I'm a man undone, falling apart at my seams, literally. Guys, if it wasn't for Jesus dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and living in us, none of us could stand for a millisecond in the presence of God in any of his glory. But we also have to remember something. God is love, but God is also holy. He is righteous. He cannot dwell with sin. He hates sin. He hates the practice of sin. We, we forget that. We love, love, love to talk about God's love, love, love. But we don't talk enough about his holiness. When we do talk about his holiness, it's, it's hard because we go, mm, I wasn't so holy an hour ago. Remember this, when God sees you, Christian, he sees the holiness of Christ. Praise God for that. We're forgiven, past, present, and future, but he still wants us to walk in that holiness. And that's the task. Look at this. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson or Shimshon. As the Hebrew says, he grew and the Lord blessed him. She was so calm. She kind of had to set her husband Manoah straight. So Samson comes into the world. It's wicked. And it took a miracle just to enter the world. And God says, hey, I'm going to be there in the midst of this boy's life. So his parents, for part of his life, do a good job of raising him in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. But we see later that Samson is just so charming, so powerful, so strong, that they kind of kowtow to him. They kind of cower to him. And that's not ever good. They stop remaining his parents and his guide. You know, something is true that no matter how old we get, you have great parents, they're always your parents. I always look to my parents. There's wisdom in your parents. They know things you don't know. You know why? Because they're 20, 30, 40 years down the road from us. Samson forgot that, or at least he got full of himself at times. But in his story, we find examples of victory and defeat, of failure and success. And we find him doing something amazing. But it happens, the most amazing thing he does happens his last moment on earth. Now, I just want to ask you this. Everybody watching, I want to ask you this. Don't be distracted. Do you really want the first time you're sold out to the purposes of God to be the last breath you take? I don't. I want it to be every breath I take. And it's not. I got a long ways to go. So how do we stand for the Lord, for his purposes? How do we stand for his glory when the odds are stacked against us? Because the odds are getting greater and greater against the church and the purposes of God. First, we have to personally accept the purposes of God, the purpose God created me for, and listen, stay focused on it. We talk a lot about purpose in this ministry. Why? Because you are not an accident. Because Proverbs 16, 4 says the Lord created everything for his purpose. That includes you because you're the greatest of his creation. But what we need to do and what we spend our time doing, this is, what I, this is why I teach every week, this is why we teach in service, is to help you and I stay focused on it. Because I don't know about you, but when we're here, sing some great worship songs, wasn't that a great worship set? I love our worship team. And, and we, we fellowship together and we encourage each other. And, you know, we, we go through all the ministries and it's a great, we're going to have the 101 today. I'm, if you've never found out what your purpose is and join the church, if it, come to 101. My wife and I are teaching. We'd love to have you there. We'll feed you 1.30 to like 5. We need you. We want you there. But 
you discover your purpose, that's easy. But staying focused on it, that's hard. There are so many distractions the moment we walk out the door, right? The moment we walk out the door. Look at Judges 13, 5. You will become pregnant, have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor. We read that. But look at the last part. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistine. He had a specific purpose. Now, I give you this spot on your, your notes so you'd have this. The Nazarite vow was being set apart and dedicated to God's purpose. And that's why in his life, he was not supposed to allow uh, uh, you know, alcohol to, to enter his body. He wasn't, wasn't supposed to cut his hair. He was supposed to be set apart for God. And by the way, Samson did become a judge of Israel for 20 years. He was a ruler in Israel. He was highly respected. But not only did he uh, stop the whole don't drink alcohol, but he did some other really bad stuff. And God still used him. You know, the Apostle Paul said it this way to the Corinthians. Remember we talked about the Corinthians last week. He said this, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch nothing that is unclean and I will embrace you. I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters, says the Lord Yahweh Almighty. Now, I have heard these verses used to beat Christians over the head. I have heard these verses used in legalistic ministries to say, you shouldn't dress like the world. You shouldn't talk like the world. I'm like, what what does that mean, right? You shouldn't listen to that music. You shouldn't go to those places. And all of a sudden, they just start putting parameters that you have to fit into this tiny little box and we have to join a commune and move to the mountains and wear gunny sack dresses and, and, and corduroy pants and flannel shirts. Nothing wrong with those. They're great, by the way. But I mean... We don't have, okay, so here's, here's the point. That's false. Paul is addressing the Corinthians and God is addressing us because less than a mile from the Corinthian church was the temple of Aphrodite. And temple prostitutes, a thousand to three thousand of them, shaved their head and had sexual relationships with the men in the community. It was an accepted practice. Women were like, okay, I have the children. You have sex with your temple prostitute. And these people were getting saved. They were coming to Christ, Christ daily in the early uh, New Testament church. So Paul is saying, guys, you got to come out from among that practice. You, you can't be engaging in that stuff and be holy. Yes, you're God's child. Yes, he loves you. But practicing that is wrong. You know, there are things that we go, you know, my conscience is clear. I don't see anywhere really in scripture that I, that I can't do that. I'll give you an example, drinking alcohol. I, I don't drink alcohol, I never have. I just don't like it. On top of that, I, I'm a pastor, so I know what I do in moderation, others do in excess. That's just reality. But that's not, it's not wrong. It's not wrong for someone to drink alcohol. It's wrong to get drunk, that's not right. The Bible condemns that, says don't do that, that's foolish. But, but drinking alcohol is not sinful. Having a beer, a glass of wine, that's not the issue. So you see how there are things that we go, okay, we can differ on that. But there are also things that we know that's not right. That's damaging to my, my reputation, God's glory. And frankly, it could be harmful. Romans 12 gives you kind of a template of how you and I can really walk in the ways of the Lord. Look at this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Will you circle living, circle holy, and then underline sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. He says, listen, the battle is fought in our minds. A thought becomes a desire. A desire becomes an action. An action becomes a habit. And a habit becomes a way of life. That's where the battle's fought. So how we think is how we live. We've been talking about this for a while. So God says, you've got to accept my purpose and stay focused on it. That's why we need our small groups in the middle of the week so we can go, oh, I was losing focus. It only took like three seconds, right? It happens. That's why we need to be gathered in a large group so we can worship together and find that that excitement and that empowerment and that encouragement. 
Then we see in Samson's life, remember God uses me even with my imperfections. I find this one incredibly encouraging. God uses me even with my imperfections. Now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run this down real quick. Let me give you a sign of Samson's imperfections, okay? So Samson, we know nothing about his first 20 years except that his parents raised him in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He, he never ever cut his hair. His hair was a sign of God's blessing, which means if his hair was ever cut, he lost his strength. What kind of strength? Superhuman strength. And there were times Samson would go to battle with the Philistines. The entire nation was afraid of him. And because of that, they sort of let the Israelites do a little bit more than they had. And so at one point, Samson gets in a battle with all of them, and he goes and catches a bunch of foxes. I know for all the animal lovers, and I'm an animal lover, I love animals so much, I'm going to go get an elk on Friday. Anyways, I mean, <laughs> loving animals. So we, they, he tied their tails together, and he lit them on fire and threw them in the fields. And they caught all the fields on fire. All right? Hey, they did battle a little different back then. Uh, at one point, Samson starts being filled with lust for a woman, and he starts going to the Philistines and sleeping with prostitutes. I mean, what could be worse? And yet, in the midst of that, there are times when God uses him. Only God knew what happened in his heart. At one point, his brethren, his brothers from Israel were like, we have got to do something about Samson, but none of us can conquer him. So they're like, going to catch him in the act. And guess what ends up happening? He runs out, goes to the city gates. According to archaeology, the gates weighed between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. He rips them off their hinges. He puts them on his shoulders, and he runs to the top of the hill to dispose them. Yeah, this dude is bigger than the rock. Okay, let's just say. And so that happens. Uh, there were other moments in, in his life. We'll, we'll look at some of the passages, but there was a time when the Philistines came after him. They thought he'd been tied up and subdued. He, he miraculously gets free, and he picks up the jawbone of a donkey that was freshly killed and strikes a thousand of them to death. One guy killing a thousand wicked people. Men, uh, uh, soldiers. But then he's doing stupid stuff in the midst of it. Because God says, listen, I love you no matter what. Look at Judges 14. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable Woman, among your relatives or among all your people, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Notice she, he, they're reasoning with their son when they should have said, whoa, no, that is a violation of God's, God's command, son. You cannot do that. They're, they're already kind of cowering to his greatness. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. And they did it. Lesson right there, pretty simple. I talked about it last week. You, you're a leader. You're a parent. Be a parent. Say it truthfully. Son, that is wrong. You should not do that. In Judges 15, it says at one point he was walking with his parents and as he was, or excuse me, he was tied up by his, his, the Israelites. And as he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting, the spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. This is very important. He doesn't say through his superhuman strength, he broke these cords. It says God released him. God did it, and he was able to fight the battle. That was on the hills of a really poor decision. Now, I find hope in the fact that God uses sinners like me. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul said this. Look at 1 Timothy 1. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. That's Paul the apostle. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example. Will you circle that? Of his great patience, even with the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. There's the gospel. 
just snuck in there, make sure you realize salvation's by believing in him. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. And he uses sinners. Listen, I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you did last night. I don't need to know. I don't know who you did it with, how many times you've done it, but I know this, God loves you. And he wants to say this to you. I am not the God of second chances. I am the God of infinite chances. So please get back up and let's move forward. Guys, failing forward is what this ministry is built on. And I believe it's what God's people should be built on. Third, we got to use every failure, fault, and challenge to be the strength of our future for God's glory. We say this a lot. I say, God never wastes a hurt. The problem is this, we do. And if you waste a hurt that you've gone through, a failure, a flaw, a challenge, if you waste that, then all you have is pain and more pain. If you don't go, okay, I messed that marriage up. I'm not going to mess this one up. You know what? I lost that job because of impropriety or because of dishonesty. I'm not going to lose this one. I had a chance to share Jesus with a loved one before they died, and I didn't do it. I'm not going to waste this opportunity. That's what God's people do. Look at Judges 14. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. We know this from reading the story. His parents were far enough ahead. They didn't even see this. At the moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. He wasn't bragging, oh, well, God came on me. You know why? Because in that moment, he recognized it was God's strength that brought the victory. That was in the middle of some dumb stuff. But he learned from his failures. And he would ultimately learn in his last victory. Look at Psalm 119. My troubles turned out all for the best. Circle that whole phrase. You have that choice. I have that choice. We can say, all of this pain in my marriage or all of this pain in my addiction or all of this pain in whatever turned out for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. I call that the textbook from the school of hard knocks. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. Can I just ask you, everybody look here, everybody watching, look here for a minute. Is God's truth, is knowing God's word more valuable to you than a gold mine? Is it more valuable to you and I than our house, or our cars, or our job, or our bank account? Because until it becomes that, you will be destined to repeat failures. Proverbs 20, 30, we looked at last week. Let's look again. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. If it doesn't change our ways, we go through it again. Because life is a trial, it's a test, it's a temporary assignment. You learn from one test so that the next time you can pass the test. And finally, Samson's story teaches us that standing against the odds comes back to relying on God's strength to accomplish the impossible. Now listen, you've heard about his amazing moments of strength. You've also heard about his equally unamazing moments of weakness. The most weak point in Samson's life was when he took a wife from the Philistines named Delilah. And it's kind of an interesting story. It kind of shows the... Uh, 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 you know, the depravity of men and women. You always pick on the guys because I is one. You know what I'm saying? So I can say, come on, come on guys, we've got to man up. And take it easy sometimes on the ladies. And uh, in this story, there's a picture of the manipulation of a woman that is really disturbing. She's with Samson and she says, she's working, by the way, as a double agent with the Philistines, right? And she says to Samson, can you just tell me, honey, how your strength, wh where you get your strength from? And he's smart enough to know, well, this isn't cool. So he tells her a lie. 
She runs back, reports it to the Philistines. They attempt to use that lie to subdue him. He wipes him out, and then she goes back and gets mad at him. I can't believe you lied to me. <laughs> Tried to figure that one out for a long time, okay? She does it not once, but twice. You know, we're all depraved in our own selfishness. Eventually, the third time, he shows his stupidity by telling her, well, if the razor touches my head and cuts my hair, I lose my strength. She goes, she tells the Philistines, they subdue him. Obviously, she did not love him the way he loved her, and he was taken to prison. They gouged his eyes out. And what happens while he's in prison really brings the fulfillment of his entire life full circle. Samson's in prison. He can't see. And the Philistines throw a major, rip-roaring, very depraved party. We're, we're talking about, you know, all of the worst kinds of sins you could imagine. They're getting drunk. They're just 3,000 of them just completely partying it up because now Israel has no savior, no, no person to fight their battles. And at that moment, the leader, the ruler, the king, the dictator says, go get Samson. Let's put on a little sideshow. Listen, guys, you never make fun of God or God's people. Never. So they bring Samson out. And Samson says to the young servant, um, put me up there near the pillars. You know, people used to make fun of the Philistine nation and make fun of the Bible because of the Philistines. They're like, there's no people group called the Philistines. That just proves the Bible's a bunch of fairy tales. Once again, mocking God. Do you know in the last seven to 10 years, there are more revelations about Ashtalon and the Philistine nation than any other archaeological discovery in the Bible. It's phenomenal. It's mind-blowing, actually. And at this point, they found what they think is the temple, and ironically, the fulcrum, the, the actual cornerstone of all of it, was two pillars. Amazing. And look at this in Judges 16. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again, O oh God. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Oh God, I know I've been in the wrong place. Can you remember me again? He's standing there going, I never forgot you. I haven't gone anywhere. Then look at this. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple, pushing against them with both hands. He prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people when he died than he did or had during his entire lifetime, which is over 3,000 people. He wiped out the entire leadership administration of the Philistines. By the way, God's in control of rulers, good or godly, and he wipes them out. He dies in the process, and Israel is set free. Now, I don't want that to be my legacy. Do you? I don't want it to be, oh God, I finally got it when I'm laying on my deathbed in a hospital room. Oh God, I finally understand how important it is to live for you because I'm two, two days from seeing you. I want it to be every moment, every breath. And it isn't, I'm still not there. And I would venture to say none of us are. You know, Jesus said that if you feel like what you're standing up against is impossible, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Don't fall into the trap of seeing stories like this and go, I'll never, you know, bring down an entire nation. I'll, I'll never, you know, tear a lion apart, figuratively or actually. What God wants to do in your life might be to tear apart the lion of your addiction. It, it might be to bring down the strongholds that are keeping your family from, from actually being healthy. It might be that you're struggling right now with your job and your finances, and he wants to meet those needs supernaturally. That's a pretty cool thing, let me tell you, because I've experienced it many, many times. Whatever it is, know this. God wants to do it in and through you. Let's go back to Hebrews 11 to close this up. 
Go back to the beginning of the hall of faith. You remember when we talked about Samson? It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for, is the evidence of things we cannot see. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. If you're here and you have never truly come to the place where you have sought God through Jesus Christ, then no matter what you've done or haven't done, how religious or non-religious you have been, you, my friend, are separated from God just like I was in my sin, just like every human being is when they're born. The Bible says God loves us, he created us, but sin infects all of us. And it's not just our sin, it's the original sin from Adam and Eve. We're all infected with it and we die in that sin, we spend eternity separated from God in hell. But God says, I love you so much that he sent his son 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, came to the world, lived a perfect life. And unlike Samson, he did everything perfect. But like Samson, was taken to a cross. When Samson's arms were stretched between two pillars, guess what he formed? The shape of a cross. When Jesus' arms were stretched out, he said, you want to know how much I love you? This much. And he died. Three days later, he rose again and he said, if you believe that I did that for you, I'll give to you everlasting life. So receive that now. Put your faith in him. You can just say this in your mind, just quietly to God. God, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. But today, I believe Jesus Christ died for me and I receive the free gift of salvation. Welcome to the family of God. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm just going to have you raise your hand and put it right back down. That just tells me you got it. So if you're saying today, I'm receiving that free gift. I'm trusting in Jesus. Would you slip your hand up? And put it right back. God bless you guys. God bless you. Many hands. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Praise God. Wow. Friend, if you made that decision, we're here for you. Told you I wouldn't embarrass you and I won't. But right now, right where you are, you take time before you leave. We make it very simple. Text the word believe to 313131. We'll give you a call this week. We've got a free Bible for you. We just want to welcome you to the family of God and let you know all the areas where we can help you grow in this ministry. Father, thank you for the example of Samson. Thank you for the picture of your grace. Thank you, Lord, for these you've called into your kingdom. As we worship you now, Lord, we give you great honor and glory. Lord, we lift up all of those in the path of the fires. Lord, we ask that you'd send rain and snow, whatever it takes, Lord, that you'd protect our firefighters, protect our responders, protect the pilots, Lord, protect the houses as they're being evacuated. Lord God, watch over them all. And Father, we ask that you'd put these fires out if it be your will. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering right now through cancer, other illnesses. God, we do pray for healing. We pray for miraculous healing. And Lord, we give you the glory for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Take this virus, Lord, we pray that you would miraculously keep it from taking any more lives and that we would be able to live our lives in full freedom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. When we introduce this song,